As a writer, part of the story that we want to get into with you, the lines aren't that clean. And a lot of these missing person cases, you don't get those clean cut lines of good guy, bad guy, missing, gone, do you? When I was doing the investigation into this Crow tribe, I was focusing on the historical failures of the U.S. government, the policing in treating these missing and murdered people, especially in the fact of the Crow tribe. The family members were the ones that were going out and getting CCTV footage and piling it together and putting cases together and bringing cases to lawyers and police and saying, no, we like know what happened to our loved one. We have this footage, we've interviewed witnesses. And even in those cases, police were not taking them seriously and not even filing report. Why is it there's always that burden from the outside placed on the victim or the survivor to try to rise up to that greater good when the dynamic should really be the other way around to protect them, should it not? Absolutely, yeah. There's a Bible verse. It talks about how they call evil good and good evil. So what abusers will try to do is they'll try to make their victim feel like they're the ones with the problem, that if they don't go along with this, then God's going to be upset with them. They're not a good person. You know, if they're really a good person, then they'll honor their father. And honoring your father means keeping all his secrets. And when I escaped domestic abuse, it really felt like I'd escaped a cult. This opioid crisis is still going on and it's taking a dreadful human toll. I, I don't even want to quote the statistics on it because I think when we hear numbers like 90,000 plus that died of overdoses last year, it's just numb to us. I was just reading a story today about Huntington where one in 10 people in Huntington is addicted to opioids. You know, it's, it's like almost inconceivable. One in 10 people? What happens to community when one in 10 people is addicted to opioids? Economically? Socially? The level of safety, what happens to the schooling, you know, how do the hospitals even keep up, the EMS running out of naloxone because so many people are dying. Seems to me like the big technology push now of working from home, this seems like it would be an absolute boon to folks yeah. who can kind of pick their own destiny. I think technology might be one of these things where it's going to run way ahead of the policy a little bit and really, really help some of these folks. Yeah, my friend David Perry, he makes this argument all the time. I believe he has dyslexia and his son is autistic and has Down syndrome. And he's written about this a lot. He says that everything that was made accessible during the pandemic has to stay accessible. When I'm working from home and I have my own office desk environment, I'm allowed to create my own environment so that it's not overwhelming sensory-wise. Uh, at the same time, it also can make it difficult when you're corresponding with people. So there's only so much you could say over chat or over Slack or over some kind of thing that you can't necessarily read from their facial expressions or their vocal inflections. It just requires employers to listen and it requires them taking it seriously. <laughs> 